60 Minutes, uh, the week before it comes out, I'm sitting on a couch, uh, sitting on my couch with my wife, and I pull up the preview. Michael Lewis is there on the screen, and Steve Croft says to him, what's the headline? And he said, the United States stock market is rigged. And I just went, oh my god, no, I can't. Michael Lewis says it on national TV, it's in, it's in the, you know, it's in the preview. So I call Michael, and I say to him, I said, Michael, why in the world did you say the stock market's rigged? And he said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, okay. He goes, is the way the stock market has been designed, does it systematically disadvantage certain people? And I said, yes, of course you know that. And he goes, well, what would you call it then? So the funny part about it is that rigged is a word. Uh, I have my money in mutual funds. Um, I don't think the investment process is broken by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but when you ask the question, is the stock market, the way it's designed, um, does it systematically disadvantage certain people? The answer to that is yes. Uh, and I'll explain to you exactly why that is. And, and I think over the course of time, what's happening is the playing field is getting more level. And as Martin indicated, the people who, it's, who, who are being systematically disadvantaged are the people who know the least about the stock market. So back to uh, the beginning here, my, my career. I uh, started as a trader. I traded energy stocks. I traded technology stocks. I cared about fundamentals of companies. Um, this is a, a typical screen. Uh, this is from Google Finance. I would use Bloomberg or Reuters. My job was I traded on behalf of mutual funds and hedge funds. I was an institutional trader um, and I actually ended up running all of risk trading for World Bank of Canada in US equities, which meant that if a mutual fund wanted to buy a million shares of advanced micro devices, AMD, I'd pull up a quote, I'd look on the offer and I'd see that there's 115,000 shares offered at $2.91. So in 2006, if I wanted to buy 100,000 shares of AMD, $2.91, I'd type that into my computer, buy 100,000, 291, enter, it would go out, and I would buy 100,000 shares of AMD, $2.91. But in 2007, when I would try to do exactly that same thing, I'd only get 80,000 of the 100 that I saw. And in 2008, I would try to buy 100, and I'd get 70,000 of what I saw. In 2009, I'd try to buy 100,000, I get 45,000 of the 100,000 shares that I saw, and it drove me insane. Um, I do what every trader does when they think their computer's not working. I'd call tech support, and the guy would run out of the back and say, what's going on? I'd say, watch this. I see 50,000 shares at $2.93. I'm going to try to buy that. I will only get a fraction of what you, you and I see on the screen. And I try to do it, and I get 15,000 shares. And I say, what do you think is happening? And he says, well, I think that there's more people that want to buy AMD, um, and it's not just you, meaning that you're part of a market that's moving very quickly and many people want to trade. Uh, and I said, okay, well, I'll prove you wrong. I said, I, now I'm going to try to buy 45,000 shares at $2.95, but I'm not going to press this button for five seconds. And if while I'm counting the stocks trading, you're right, other people want to buy AMD. I said, but nothing's going to happen until I press this button. So I'd count to five or seven or whatever. I could change it, it doesn't matter. And then I'd hit the button, and that's when the stock would move. That's when the, the, the offers would disappear. Um, and I'd say to them, I said, I'm the event. This is not a random occurrence. The only reason people want to buy AMD is because I want to buy it. I had no idea why this was happening. It went on for two years. Right? Michael Lewis, you know, I think some people, if they haven't read the book, you know, kind of would view me as a disruptor, and that's like the opposite of what I am. I spent my entire life getting along with people. This is not, uh, in a million years, I never thought I'd be in the position I'm in right now. Um, this went on for two years. Myself, my traders, we just dealt with it. It became common knowledge that if I saw 500,000 shares of a stock on the offer, that I would only get a fraction of what I actually saw. Um, I got really lucky. In 2009, RBC offered me an opportunity to run what's called electronic sales and trading. And what that meant, in a nutshell, is I went from managing a group of people, human traders, um, to computer programmers and network engineers that were building algorithms that our traders would use. So I went from managing traders to managing people who built programs and algorithms um, for those traders. I actually didn't want the job. So my first answer to them offering me this job was actually no. Uh, and it's funny, because life is, is a lot about decisions and a lot about luck. Um, and for some reason, my boss kept persisting. I think you should really take a look at this job. I didn't want to do it. Um, actually, funny story is that we had, we had bought a company 
Um, terrible, terrible company. We bought in 2007. They were, they were supplying the technology that we were using, and I actually thought they were partially responsible for the fact that I couldn't trade. We buy this company, it's a pile of garbage, and I can't trade. They fired the CEO, and they wanted me to take that company over, and, and I just didn't want to do it. I went out, and I said, okay, I'll do a little bit of due diligence to see if I want to take this job. And I sat, went out, and I sat with um, a friend of mine who actually worked at SAC Capital in Stanford, Connecticut, Steve Cohen's fund. And I said, if anyone has the best tools, algorithms in the market, it's SAC Capital. So I sat with a trader from SAC. He was using algorithms from Goldman Sachs and Credit Suisse and Morgan Stanley, et cetera, et cetera. He could not buy or sell what he saw on his screens either. And that was the first time where the light bulb went off in my head to say, this isn't an RBC problem. It's not a crappy technology problem. One of the, the biggest hedge funds in the world is using tools built by all of the largest banks, and he can't buy or sell what he saw, sees on his screen either. At that point in time, I actually knew the problem was systemic. So I took the job because I really wanted to figure out what was happening. And it turns out that some of the people that I, you know, again, life has a lot to do with luck. I was hiring people in the spring of 2009. That's when I took the job. And if you look at a chart of the S&P, the absolute bottom of that chart um, is spring of 2009. And all of a sudden, I could convince a bunch of people who never in, in their wildest dreams ever wanted to work for the Royal Bank of Canada, um, that the Royal Bank of Canada was actually a pretty good place for people to work. So I built a team at RBC. For the first time also, I started to read about high frequency trading. I had no idea what that was, but I knew that it sounded pretty important and I needed to hire people from that industry, and I did. And what some of the people from the high frequency trading industry explained to me was that the 100,000 shares of AMD that I saw on my screen wasn't just at one stock market, the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. There were actually at the time 13 different stock exchanges in the United States that were geographically located in different buildings. Now the geography actually is important here because what that means is that when I see 100,000 shares on my screen and I try to enter an order, me pressing the button once isn't just one action. Me pressing the button once sends one message to something called a smart order router. It splits my order up into as many as 13 different messages and blasts them out to the stock exchanges. This is gonna sound crazy, but RBC at the time, we were located in downtown Manhattan. All the exchanges were in New Jersey, which is west of Manhattan. So what, what that means is that my one order to buy 100,000 shares of AMD, let's say there's 25,000 shares offered at four exchanges, BATS, Direct Edge, NASDAQ, and New York Stock Exchange, the four biggest exchanges at the time. I would blast four orders out to the market from RBC, and they would arrive in sequence first at BATS, because BATS is located in Weehawken, New Jersey, right on the other side of the Lincoln Tunnel, its closest to Manhattan then Direct Edge and Secaucus, then NASDAQ and Carteret, and the New York Stock Exchange built a new, uh, I, I heard, I heard, they spent close to a billion dollars building a data center in Mawa, New Jersey, and one in Basildon. Um, it, would, it would arrive there last. It was 60 miles away from NASDAQ. The difference in time, this is gonna sound completely bananas, but was two milliseconds between arriving at the first and the last exchange. At the time, I thought that was actually pretty fast. It's 300 milliseconds to blink your eye. Two milliseconds to me seemed pretty fast. Except for the fact that one of the people I hired, this guy by the name of Ronan Ryan, had just come from building out high frequency trading infrastructure for some of the biggest high frequency trading firms there were. And he said, I got bad news for you, Brad. I can get from one building, bats, to the next in 476 microseconds. A microsecond is one millionth of a second. He could actually get there four times faster than I could, which meant that as my orders were going out to the market, we would arrive at bats first, Ronan's clients would pick up a signal and race us to Direct Edge, NASDAQ, and New York. And they were doing two things. One is they were canceling their sell orders. Now that they know a buyer has come in and bought everything all of the AMD shares at 291 on BATS, they're racing out to cancel any sell orders they have in the market. But second, they're also trying to buy shares ahead of me to sell back to me at a higher price. And this is what was happening. After Ronan explained this to me, I said to him, I said, well, can we get faster? And he said, well, he's like, we're the Royal Bank of Canada. We will never be faster than anybody, right? So, he, so 
um, getting faster was not a solution. Um, there were things that his clients were doing um, that we would never do. A, a funny story is that also proximity, where you're located in the data center. So now that I've paid to be in the data center, where you are in the data center matters. And he said that next to one of the big stock exchanges, Toys R Us actually owned a cabinet next to one of the big stock exchanges by accident. They were there. I think they were probably running their website or something like that from there. Um, and he said he was, enter he was working on behalf of clients trying to pay Toys R Us Im insane amounts of money. And they finally gave in. They finally sold their space. And they wanted to leave Toys R Us as the identifier on the cage because they didn't want anyone to know who was in the cage. Proximity matters. And they spent a ton of money on that. He said, we cannot be faster than them. But the one thing we could do was get slower. And at the time, in 2009, this sounds crazy. Every big bank out there was selling to their clients. We're the fastest. We're this. We're that. We're microsecond. Um, we're nanosecond. And we said, you know what? We're going to get slower. And what that means is slow down our fastest connections to try to get all orders to arrive at all exchanges as close to simultaneous as possible. And in theory, the way to think about this is send the order to New York Stock Exchange first, send the order to BATS last to arrive simultaneous, and we actually were able to do that. We got our arrival variance down to 290 microseconds. It is not as easy as this diagram makes it look. It was actually very, very hard to do because latency changes. At the beginning and end of the day, there are more messages on the network because of the open and the close. Latency fluctuates. So this was actually something where we had to use messages in a real-time basis to calculate variances between exchanges, but we got our variance down to 290 microseconds, which meant I could now buy or sell everything I saw on my screen. Um, this was the easiest product in the world to sell. I'd walk into any asset manager out there and I'd say, you, you want to buy Bank of America, you see 2 million shares in the offer, how much of that do you get? People would say anything from 500,000 to a million shares. I said, I'll get you all 2 million. And they would say, give me the product. The product actually was, it took RBC um, from 19 to number one in the Greenwich Associates survey in one year. Um, it was a $100 million product in less than 18 months. The problem was, is that clients couldn't just trade with RBC. One, one, one person, one, one of my closest clients put it to me brilliantly. He said, Brad, you've solved 2% of my trading problem. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, 2% is the amount of, of, of trades that I can actually send to RBC. He's like, what about the other 98% of my trading issues? So this actually got us thinking quite a bit. You know, we wanted to understand, you know, a lot of people villainize high frequency trading. I think, again, not every person that uses a computer to trade is harming the market. If you're, if you're arbitraging an ETF against the 30 underlying stocks, there's not, a computer does that. There's nothing wrong with that. If there's an ADR that's listed uh, in London, it trades in the New York, there's nothing wrong with arbitraging correlated products. But there are some high frequency traders that are actually picking up signals and racing. Uh, we call this latency arbitrage. But high frequency traders have no customers. They're capitalists in many ways, and you know, again, some slant on capitalism, but um, they're looking at an inefficient system, and they're saying, how can I capitalize on that? On the other hand, how can someone pick up a signal at bats and race me to another exchange and get there in 476 microseconds? And the answer to that is because stock exchanges themselves aren't exactly what you think stock exchanges are anymore. A lot of people think about New York Stock Exchange and think about Wall Street and the big bell ringing on CNBC. They think about NASDAQ and Times Square. But in reality, no trading happens in these buildings. The irony of it is that the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, the people on the floor have never been farther away from the actual point of sale because all of those orders are beamed out to data warehouses in Mawa, New Jersey, and Carteret, New Jersey. That's where all the trading happens. So this idea about proximity on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange on CNBC, it's not relevant because all the trading happens in these data warehouses. We started to ask ourselves questions, you know, back to Martin's introduction, why does a stock exchange exist? If you sit back and you ask yourself, why is the greatest question in the world? I, I, I've, just, I've gotten, I started IEX because all, I would just incessantly ask these questions to myself. A stock exchange exists to help companies raise capital, to ensure that those companies meet certain standards. 
and to help that capital and that equity change hands between investors in a just and equitable way. That's why a stock exchange exists. Except you start to read articles to say, well, hold on a second, why are exchanges creating complex order types? 2009, the way I learned about high frequency trading is a, is a stock exchange called Direct Edge built something called a flash order, which would give people a preview of an order before sending it on to another stock exchange, essentially a free look. Exchanges collectively in the United States pay $3 billion plus in what are called rebates. This is like figuring out that the electricity company pays you to turn your lights on. It was something that just completely baffled me when I learned it, but they're paying people billions of dollars to trade, which means they don't actually make money from trading anymore, which is why they open data centers to sell people access, to sell people technology, to sell people cabling. They've even gone as far to put microwave towers on the roof of the exchanges to beam orders back and forth faster. Because all of this really adds up to the 476 microseconds that Ronan needed to beat me. It's been sold to him and his clients by the stock exchanges. The stock exchanges were enabling the issue that I just explained to you, among many other issues. We, we only have a, a few minutes here, so I can't get too deep into them. A stock exchange exists to help companies raise capital to help investors allocate that capital. They do not exist to sell this stuff. But why do they do it? So first of all, they sell fast data, right? If you want to learn about the, the changing of a price faster than someone else, you have to pay for it. If you think about it theoretically, though, there isn't anything technically wrong with someone getting data before someone else, because there's no way to ensure that everyone gets it at the same time. If I broadcast a signal from this stage, everyone in this room will get it first. Maybe someone in the front row will actually get it technically before someone in the back. Definitely before someone in New York will get it or someone in San Francisco will get it. There's no way to ensure everyone gets data at exactly the same time. The problem is the person with advanced information, how do they monetize the information? They monetize it by trading against someone who doesn't yet have it. That's why, let's, insider trading. I'm a lawyer, I work on a deal, I find out that company XYZ is going to get bought out. There's nothing illegal about me possessing that information. There is something wrong with me running out into the market before it's announced and buying up stock of XYZ, that's a problem. And here what you have is you have people, because you can't ensure everyone gets information at the same time, some people know something before someone else. Why do people pay hundreds of millions of dollars for the technology to be right next to stock exchanges? because it gives them the ability to trade hundreds of times, thousands of times, before that same piece of information makes it to the last person. Let alone the fact that you're processing that many times with your eye and you're thinking about it. I mean, we're talking about microseconds here, right? So they sell technology to allow people to capitalize on the advanced information that they're selling them. And what it's really, what's really happened is it's led to the rise of what's called high-frequency trading. August 24th, when the market went haywire, High frequency traders were greater than 50% of the volume. They are every single day. I mean, back in 2012, in the fall of 2012, we had seriously volatile times, and one of the big clearing firms, the head of a clearing firm, said 75% of all of our volume today was high frequency trading. So when the majority of volume in the markets is traded by people who do not care about fundamentals, what does that fundamentally mean for the stock market? It's a pretty scary thought, right? 